Well, hello, everyone. I'm James Dobson, and you're listening to Family Talk, a ministry dedicated to marriage, to parenting, to the sanctity of human life, to the cause of Christ, and to the preservation of righteousness in the culture. Those are the issues and the causes that drive this ministry. Shirley and I have been out in California for several months where I'm working on a new book. This one's on marriage. It's been 31 years since I've written a book on that subject, and that's what I'm here trying to do. This is why I am late in expressing my sadness at the passing of the great Christian evangelist, Dr. Luis Plow, who died on March the 11th at 86 years of age. He went to heaven after a three-year battle with lung cancer. Dr. Palau was born in Argentina after the untimely death of his father. He immigrated to the United States where at 19 years of age, he hosted his own Christian radio program. And then he served as a Spanish language translator for the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And then he began preaching in Latin American countries and then ultimately to places all around the world. He held crusades much like Billy Graham did. And he was much loved by us and by millions of other people. And uh, he and Billy were very close friends until Billy's death. And now Luis is with him on the other side. So uh, what we're going to do today is to let you hear a recording of my first introduction and interview with Dr. Palau. Uh, that was in 1984. And uh, I invited to come to Focus on the Family to do a radio program. And we did that. We talked for a few minutes and we walked into the studio and we recorded what that now amounts to a two-part program. We're going to hear the first half of that interview today. And uh, tomorrow, I'll let you hear the second half. So, here now is Dr. Luis Palau and me uh, talking about the biblical concept of the family. You're often called the Billy Graham of Latin America. Is that a fair assessment? How do you feel about that? Well, you know, it's sort of embarrassing in a way because uh, Billy Graham is such a great man of God. I suppose people use it just to quickly say what it is we do, mass yeah. crusades on television and radio, uh -huh. and it's a quick way to describe it. But, you know, Billy is such a tremendous preacher and so superior in the Lord that it's sort of embarrassing, really. The largest crowd I've ever spoken to, I believe, is 19,000 people, and I was keenly aware of how difficult it is to hold the attention of that many people. Yes. How in the world do you speak to 700,000? I know that's not <laughs> typical, but no. uh, how do you read Reach that many people? Well, it's the same as 19,000, I think. What they did in Guatemala is that each one brought their transistor radio. We didn't have a good enough PA system. They didn't ah. at that point. So they had five radio stations transmitting simultaneously, and thousands of people had their uh, transistor radio up, and you could hear the echo all over this massive <laughs> military field, you know? Everybody ah. just listening. And uh, really, you just, like you do, you have to be anointed by the Spirit. You have to have something to say. You've got to say it quickly and with a touch of humor like you do. I think that's what keeps people with you. Well, you and I have developed a friendship in recent years. And uh, so. uh, let me tell you why I felt so strongly about your being here today. And uh, I know that you know how I feel about this. Uh, if our country is to survive... It will not be because we have more gifted psychologists and more books and more counseling and more knowledge about the family. But if it's going to be uh, successful, if it's going to survive the, the stresses that are on it now, it will be because of a return to those values and that mm -hmm. commitment, that relationship with Jesus Christ, which is your ministry. And God has blessed it not only in Latin America, but you're also – preaching in the United States and in Europe as well at this time, aren't you? That's right. And, and you, you identify with what I just said. That mm. is the answer. Mm. That is the future, isn't it? You're right. You're so right. And uh, I tell you, Dr. Dobson, I feel that unless we have a revival, the Nor United States of America will go the way of all flesh. England is a model of that, a sad model. England has gone, as Dr. Bill Lawrence says, 
from a missionary sending organization to a mission field in one and a half generations. That's unbelievable. England used to send all the missionaries of the world. Now, the Archbishop of Canterbury, before the present one, said, send us missionaries, England is a mission field. And it absolutely is. Now, America's going in that direction. You were telling me before we went on the air that only 4% of the people in London attend church at all, ever? That's absolutely right. And 4%. 50% of them have never read the Bible one time. Exactly. Now, in England, across the board, 55 million people, 35% have never read the Bible. In London, the estimate is 50% have never once opened the Bible to read it, once. This is a serious study by the Bible societies, by the way. And this was a nation one generation ago which considered itself a Christian nation. Exactly. And two generations ago, you had Queen Victoria, you had Spurgeon and Campbell Morgan and F.B. Meyer, all the great preachers that made England a solid nation. Uh, once uh, a BBC interviewer said to me, why are you in England? Aren't you flogging a dead horse? Which is a very British phrase. And I said, yes, but of course God has power to raise dead horses. That's uh, <laughs> one of the angles. But London is in a moral crisis and so is all of England. Um, moral standards have gone down and the nation recognizes it. That's why they're asking Billy Graham to come back. They've asked us to come back because they feel the, the young generation does not know the Ten Commandments. The Bible societies in their study said to Billy and to me, they said, look, take nothing for granted. Don't say King David. They never heard of King David. Don't say the prodigal son. They've never heard of the prodigal son. Even when you say Jesus, you better say Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the founder of Christianity. That's how mm. far they are. And Americans don't realize that. I was there in 1969 and in 1972, and I was impressed by these gorgeous, beautiful church buildings and nobody in them. I mean, six, eight, ten people huddled in the middle of these huge churches. That's exactly. uh, Luis, let's, let's bounce across the water to America now. Is there a direct parallel? Are we going in that same direction? Do you see the same moral decline that you... Uh, saw there? Well, I see two things. I see the USA, on the one hand, a great vigorous Christianity. You know, we've got to praise the Lord for the good things going on in America. We mustn't allow ourselves to be alarmed to the point where we don't see the hand of God. Good things happening among college students, among home Bible studies, your own ministry uh, with the family. Mm -hmm. Uh, take, uh, you know, all the Bible studies on the radio, take Chuck Swindoll, take all the other great men. There's a great movement of God. On the other hand, you are as alarmed as we are about the divorce rate, about the moral standards, about uh, the, the low ethical standards. That's what's alarming. You see, in, in Britain, World War I and World War II really demoralized the nation in the sense of de-moralizing it. Mm. There has been a decay. Now, America is going in the same direction. The frightening thing is this. The way the family is going in America, unless our revival turns it around, we'll end up just like Latin America. Now, I'm not insulting Latin America. You know, I come from there. and Latin You were born America, in Argentina. I was born in Argentina, which is way down in South America, so I'm a real Latin, although I've become an American now. But, you know, 72% of the population of Latin America is illegitimate. Now, if the USA continues in this trend, you're going to have the same situation in America. Uh, Latin America has all the resources to be a successful continent and actually enjoy a successful standard of living. Why don't we have it? Because of immorality. I am convinced. I have said it in press conferences. I've said it at universities. Nobody's ever challenged me. There's a direct relationship between the, the moral values and behavior and the way the country goes, prosperity included. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we Christians believe that. You know, uh, uh, your sins will find you out, the scripture says. And uh, uh, according to your holiness, therefore shall come your success. You know, if we don't follow holiness, we therefore cannot expect the blessing of God. Now, it isn't that God necessarily sends fire from heaven. It's that we set in motion such actions that destroy the nation. Uh -huh. uh, in Latin America, you take a man converted to Christ in between 35 and 40 years of age has usually had three women in his life and children by those three women. 
Now, mm-hmm. Not just relationships. You're talking about he has lived with He's, or or had sex with three women outside of his own home and family. Oh, yes. I'm not talking about casual sex, as they yeah. say nowadays. I'm talking about living with a woman for a period of time as though they were husband and wife. Maybe the first time when he's 18. Maybe 18 to 23, one woman, three children. 24 to, to 30, second woman, two or three children. 30 to 40, another woman, another two or three children. You see, Latin America is absolutely populated by the situation now that kind of looseness it's not that the latins are worse than anybody else we are nice people (laughs) you know the thing is this when you don't have a biblical standard or if the standard is there but you don't have the power of god at work in you therefore the way you live affects your attitude towards the family who are you loyal to who do you appeal to and when you have a low view of the family therefore Either previously you had a low view of God and following you have a lower view of God because a young man, as we all know, who uh, sees hypocrisy and duplicity in the father and mother or who finds them unreliable. How can you speak about God our father Mm -hmm. when in the little person's mind the father is that man that just walked out? Or the father is the man that he saw sleeping with another woman. Therefore, their image of God goes down. And it's a downward cycle that only a revival. That's why we come back to your statement, uh, Jim, that only a revival will bring things back to God. Because a revival is a breakthrough into the society. It's breaking up the molds. A revival is a confrontation. That's what it really amounts to. Between the way our culture is going and the demands of God. How does it start? I feel a little bit like the uh, mice that agreed there ought to be a bell on the neck of the cat, but nobody knew how to get it there. How do we turn our hearts toward God? Where does a revival begin? Mm. That's a deep question. (laughs) I think of Latin America and some places where I have seen touches of revival. And I think it starts with a few concerned people, and America has them, like you, like so many others, like Bill Bright, and so many others that have a burden for revival. You have to have the burden. But you know, then has to come a breaking and a cleansing. Mm -hmm. I think the burden has got to go beyond us talking about it. I think we have to get on our knees and pray. You know, the old timers used to talk about praying through. And a word called repentance that Uh, I don't hear much anymore. Tell us what repentance is. Well, you know, I think repentance comes, is is part of when a group of men or women all, all together come and they say, oh God, this cannot go on. And then you begin to search the mind of God and you will not let up until you feel that there has been a breakthrough, until you sense that the hand of God has touched something and you say, the Lord has answered, now we must act. Mm -hmm. Then you leave that place with an authority that is supernatural. Mm -hmm. And then God uses individuals to begin to touch the conscience because repentance begins with a conscience that comes alive, doesn't it? And Mm -hmm. so therefore, that's why I think your ministry to the family can be used of God to bring repentance. And I would encourage you that among other things that you're doing, you're not just counseling us and giving us good ideas on how to handle the grandparents and memories, all those things that have blessed me that you've had on the program, (laughs) but also it touches our conscience. The conscience is where revival starts. Unless the conscience comes alive that I'm not living up to God's standards, I will never repent. And Mm -hmm. the family, I think, is in the West where we most feel our guilt, and we should. And the family is the window into the soul of the West, I feel. That's why we emphasize the family, and that's why we're thrilled by what the Lord is doing here. Mm -hmm. You've got to keep a balance also. Now, I think on the one hand, there must be a call to repentance. But, you know, you've got to compare nations also to Mm -hmm. keep your balance. America has thousands of godly families beautiful families and you know comparing to most of the world there's more concern for the family in this country probably than any other country in the world and which yet is, we have the highest divorce rate of any nation in the civilized world but maybe that's why we have a concern mm-hmm. because we see the disaster taking yeah. place we are hardly aware why it happened and it's because we've turned away from god and we've turned away as a nation again i say there are millions of godly families but as a nation We have downgraded the Word of God. And you know, if there's one thing that Great Britain is paying for is their low view of Scripture. In other words, they have allowed themselves to doubt the Word of God. I have not heard all your programs, but I know you have a high view of Scripture. In England, they have sowed so many doubts. And I bring England because it hurts America. There are, you know, cousins. And therefore, what our cousins do over there affects us here. 
the low view of Scripture. I mean, if you begin as church leaders to doubt the authority of the Bible, if you begin to play games and and sort of flirt with low view of Scripture, mm-hmm. and all right, I'm not going to get on this program, and you may not even want me to. You may clip me off. But um, if you begin to play games about creation, you begin to play games about the flood. You begin to play games about Jonah and the whale. You, you know, take one section out. Where do you stop? Yes, sir. Then you begin to doubt the virgin birth. Eventually, nothing counts. And although people will say, and in Europe they'll say this, Jim. They'll say, oh, we believe in the Word of God, and we wouldn't think of checking with anything else. But, of course, you've got to be realistic. The moment you said that, but, we've got to be realistic, you might as well throw the whole thing out the window. Either the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God that you can trust, (laughs) or you might as well set up your own religion and go ahead and anything goes. And, in a sense, the moment you try to bring down ethical standards, what the Word says, what the Ten Commandments clearly state about ethics and the family, you might as well throw it all out. Luis, in the closing moments of this broadcast, I'd like you to talk specifically to somebody, a a certain person that I have in mind. Uh, We try on this broadcast to have a certain individual in mind for each program, and it varies from program to program. I'd like you to talk to the man who knows the way he was raised in it, or at least he's heard it. Maybe at one time in his life he was walking with Christ, but now he's gotten wrapped up in his job and in his work, and he's not leading his own family spiritually, and he knows it isn't right, but he's got all these pressures on him. What do you have to say to him? In Latin America, religion has always been considered the domain of women and children. So when I started out, I I used to pray, Lord, give me a burden for the men and use me to reach out to the men. I am convinced that it's still scriptural and it does bless nations when, in God's order of things, men become a model. Mm. So, usually, I I, I must come on scripturally from my viewpoint. I don't want to hurt your listeners or whatever stance you take. No, that's why I ask you the question, because I feel strongly about what you're about to say. Well, I feel this way. That God appointed the man to lead in spiritual issues as well as other issues, but especially spiritually. And I feel that we men honor or dishonor God by the way we walk and by the way we act. And, you know, Colossians says, husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Mm. And our little boys and girls are watching us. How do I treat my wife? And then he goes on to say, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Now, you've used those verses many times. But the thing that that I would say to a man is this, Man, what example are you giving your children? When you die, what will your children say about you as a man? Will they say, My father was a hypocrite? Will they say, as some fellows have said to me, In my father's home, I never heard a prayer to God in all my life. Uh, I say to men, man, have you become such a pagan? Are you so heathen that you have never opened the word of God and let your boys and girls in the word of God? I often say to men, man, have you ever gotten on your knees beside your bed with your wife beside you, put your arm around her, and read one chapter, just one chapter from the Word of God, the Bible, have you ever, with your arm around your wife, on your knees, beside your bed, led your woman in prayer to God? And I often say to men, and I'd like to say to your men right now, I have seen more men whose families were, if not breaking up, cold and unwarm. Take advantage of this counsel. Get on their knees. Put their arm around their wife. Open the Bible to John chapter 1. Read it, the man read it, and then say to his wife, we are going to talk to God. And the love that comes when a man leads his wife Mm -hmm. to God is so profound. (laughs) I often tell men, you know, I am gone a lot from home. But when I take my wife Pat in my arms and, and I lead in prayer, I begin to cry. You know, it's an amazing thing. And it's not that I'm a crybaby. I'm a pretty hard nosed character. 
But there's something fantastically beautiful when a man takes his wife in his arms and they talk to God. The love, the warmth is unbelievable. It seems like the two souls just merge into one. Now, a man who doesn't do that is a disgrace to manhood. A man who doesn't do that is a shame to himself. He's dishonoring his creator. He is being less than manly when he never, do you know there are men, Jim, who in their entire lives have never led their wives in one talk with God. There are men who have never said to their children, let's talk to your heavenly father. Even if they're teenagers, before they leave the door, you know, give them a hug and touch their cheek and say, buddy, I'm going to be praying for you all day. What a difference to send them out on the street. Having first been in the word before breakfast or after breakfast and on your knees talking to your heavenly father. So a man is a man when he leads his wife in the things of God, when he leads his children in the things of God, and when he makes God the center of his home. Otherwise, what is the meaning of life? And the final thing I'll say is what I often say to men, and I feel great authority in saying it. What memories are you going to leave behind? My father died when I was only 10 years old, and the memories I have of my father are so strong I saw him on his knees reading the book of Proverbs. My image of him is seeing him in the Lord's Supper, calling out a psalm or calling out a hymn. Uh, My image of him is my dad, who was a big businessman in his day, standing on a street corner beside the missionary, passing out tracts and talking to people who insulted him and spat on him and threw rocks or mud at him. And there was my dad, you know. So I want to be that kind of man. And I say to every man listening to your program today, What kind of a man are you? What images are you leaving in your children's minds? You know, Luis, uh, you and I recently attended the birthday party of Billy Graham. And uh, Shirley and I were riding home together on the freeway after that. And uh, we were uh, sharing with one another what we were thinking during that evening. Because, as you recall, they showed films of his entire ministry. And the power of the Lord was there. And and, uh, I remember saying to her, Shirley, uh, what was going through my mind is that God is expanding our outreach and uh, doing great things, I think, through what we're attempting to do. Mm. But if I get so caught up in that Mm. that I don't take the time to do exactly what you're talking about with my children, my family, Mm. with my wife, then I will live to regret it. You said it. And there is no good work. I don't care what you do for a living, even if you speak to 700,000 people as you have, Mm. if you don't take the time for that responsibility you're talking about right now, then you've missed the first priority. You've said it. You're a failure. You know, I don't care who listens to you. I don't care if you've got pictures in the White House and with Queen Elizabeth. What is the point if at the end of your life you are not godly? It's just not worth it. Well, this is James Dobson again, and you've been listening to an interview with Dr. Luis Palau, a wonderful, much-loved evangelist who held crusades, much like the ones that Billy Graham led all over the world. But uh, in his case, especially in Latin America, where he was most known, Luis and I had just met on the afternoon that we recorded the program that you just heard. And uh, we're going to hear the second half of that tomorrow. There is a surprise. Something dramatic happened at the end of the second interview. And I hope that you will be with us next time. God's blessings to you all. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hi everyone, Dr. Tim Clinton here. When you think about your family and where they'll be when you're no longer living, are you worried? Are you confident? You hopeful? What kind of a legacy are you leaving for your children and their children right now? Here at Family Talk, we're committed to helping you understand the legacy that you're leaving your family. Join us today at drjamesdobson.org. You're gonna find helpful insights, tips, and advice from Dr. Dobson himself. And remember, your legacy matters. 
commitment. Why is this simple concept missing from so many marriages today? Here's Dr. James Dobson with Family Talk. I read recently of a wedding ceremony where the bride and groom each pledged the words, to stay with you for as long as I shall love you. I doubt if their marriage lasted very long. Romantic love, along with other emotions, may ebb and flow through the course of time. Commitment is the source of all stability in the marital relationship. It is the most important ingredient. But commitment isn't a feeling, it's a choice. Can you imagine a parent saying to his child, I'll be your parent for as long as I shall love you? That would hardly produce stability and well-being in the child. Nor does a wishy-washy philosophy create stability in a marriage. That's why the traditional wedding vows read, in sickness and in health, for richer or poorer, for better or worse, forsaking all others till death do us part. That's the real meaning of commitment. Emotion is the caboose on the train. The engine is a commitment of the will, which can steadily pull the relationship through all of the ups and downs of everyday living. To get involved, go to drjamesdobson.org.